taxes, reductions uh, in I services the measures, and reductions in so on. So the Concordat continues. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements is planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Could the First Minister give me an honest assessment of how our schools are doing? Well, I First think Minister. it's probably better to give the assessment of the Account Commission on attainment, uh, page six. Performance has improved against all 10 of the attainment measures we examined over the last decade. Or, or page 18 of the report, uh, attainment improved by 4% for the measures S4 level between 2004 and 2013. At S5 and S6 levels, attainment improved between 5 and 10%. The vast majority of the improvements in attainment have been made in the last five years. I think that seems a pretty fair summary. John <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad the First Minister mentioned that report because I think we should look at it in some detail. Because the Audit Scotland report does paint a slightly different picture from what the First Minister has said. It said, it said, it said, international comparisons show that the academic performance of Scotland's pupils is static at best and in relative decline to others at worst. The report said, Quote, in recent years, international attainment surveys have prov provided evidence that Scotland's educational attainment levels relative to some other countries are falling. To emphasise the point, later on in the report, it repeated, Scotland's performance levels relative to some other countries are also falling. Can the First Minister confirm that is what Audit Scotland said about our schools and tell us what he's doing about it? First Minister. I, I can confirm. You see the, the two quotes that I gave from the report, because let's talk about it in some detail. Uh, the one that says where attainment improved by 4%, S4 and S5 and S6, between 5 and 10%. It then goes on to say the vast majority of the improvements in attainment have been made in the last five years. Now, of course, the reason for saying that is that the last internationally recognised study is the PISA study, and we had the 2012 figures. Unlike the previous PISA study, over the previous few years of when the Labour Party were in power, when Scotland's international position was declining across all of the ranges, the last study showed that Scotland's position had remained the same. That is the first time that decline under Labour has been reversed in the attainment, the PISA study. That's why I suspect the Account Commission report pointed out that the vast majority of improvements and attainments have been over the last five years. So I don't know if Joanne Lamont finds it at all embarrassing that the international comparisons that she cite show that Scotland's position was declining when the Labour Party were in power, but now over the last five years in particular, this report shows attainment levels improving. Isn't that a substantial credit? to the pupils and teachers of Scotland. Their commitment to our school system under the most difficult circumstances of Westminster-induced austerity that they have managed to bring on such a performance. Joanne Lawrence. We Lawrence. should, of course, congratulate every parent, child and teacher, but they deserve better from this government. He doesn't respond to the points I make about what the Audit Scotland report says, but let's look again. Here is what Audit Scotland put in their original report. Audit Scotland said, and I quote, comparing similar levels of qualifications with other countries in the UK identifies a much slower pace of improvement for Scotland. The report went on, and I quote, the pace of improvement remains slow as overall levels of attainment have only improved marginally. And why could that be? The report says, between 2010-11 and 2012-13, education revenue spending reduced by £184 million in real terms, 5%. Can the First Minister confirm that is what Audit Scotland said about our schools and tell us what he's doing about it? First Minister. Well, uh, before we slip away from the, the reality that the international performance was declining uh, when yeah. Labour were in power uh, and has now the attainment has been improving, particularly over the last five years with the SNP in power, let's not slip away from that rather important point that I know the Labour benches want to see uh, re-emphasised. Now let's turn to the finance that's available. 
It is certainly true that real spending on education has declined in the years of the three years of the study, and they put the decline at 5 per cent. That is hardly surprising, is it? Because real spending available to Scotland from Westminster declined over revenue by 4.1 per cent over that period of time. And if you exclude health, where we believe you have got to protect the real health budget for very obvious reasons, because our commitment to the National Health Service, then the decline in Scotland's spending is much greater than 5 per cent, significantly greater than 5 per cent. Does Joanne Lamont not realise that declines in spending are the reality? Is Scotland's fate under the austerity measures, first pursued by the Labour Party and continued by her colleagues, as she put it yesterday, in the Conservative Party? Joanne Lamont. These, of course, are the colleagues who supported SNP's budget between 2007 and 2011. A budget the budget which the late lamented David McClatchy said was the next best thing to a Tory budget itself, so we don't need any lectures in that regard. The First Minister has ignored, has ignored, that he has ignored, has ignored the comments that I identified in that report. But of course, the excerpts which I have just read out were in Audit Scotland's origin, original report, and that was before the Scottish Government got their hands on it. Absolutely. In the final report... In the, final report, in the final report, those criticisms disappear because the Scottish Government didn't want the public to know. The decline in standards taken out. The fact that the rest of the UK... The fact... The decline in standards taken out. The fact that the rest of the UK is improving faster than Scotland taken out. In the draft report, the truth about our schools was in, but in the final report, it was watered down, and we have got entitled to know who took that decision. For is it not the case, for is it not the case, the first casualty of this government is truth, and isn't it the case that just as with everything else, the First Minister doesn't trust the people of Scotland with the truth? First Minister. Uh, the most remarkable decline in standards is the decline in the standards of Joanne Lamont's questioning. We're now at the stage where we have to impugn the integrity of Audit Scotland for Joanne Lamont to try and make a point. But the problem for Joanne Lamont is the comparisons with the Labour Party don't rely just on the Audit Scotland report, an organisation of integrity and outstanding integrity, whose report it was, the Account Commission, published today. They rely on the PISA statistics. The PISA statistics show that Scotland's performance was declining when Joanne Lamont was a minister. I don't hold her personally responsible, but she's jointly and severally liable for that decline. And the attainment has improved since the SNP came to power. That is a substantial uh, achievement under the circumstances of austerity. Now, Joanne Lamont doesn't seem to like the fact that she described the Tories as her colleagues. If she doesn't like it, then why did she say it yesterday? Yes. Or even more important, not just what she says, the problem for Joanne Lamont is when she's standing shoulder to shoulder, hand in glove with the Conservative Party. There is no point in trying to complain when people point out that she says their colleagues, next thing you know, she'll be calling them comrades in the Conservative Party. And I say to the Labour benches, the price that they will pay for their association with their colleagues will be a high one indeed. And it will be one of the arguments which takes Scotland forward to a yes vote this coming September. Question two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask Order. The first minister. Order. Let us hear Ms Davidson. Thank you, President Order. Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans in the near future, but I think the comrade's outfit just sums up the question. <laughs> Ruth Davidson. I take compliments wherever they're proffered. <laughs> uh, I don't get many, but I'll take them when I get them. Uh, Presiding Officer, in committee last week, the Scottish Government's Chief Economic Advisor was asked by my colleague Murdo Fraser 
if his office had done any additional work on set-up costs of an independent Scotland beyond the white paper? And the answer was no. Can the First Minister answer the same question this week? Has any further work been done by the Scottish Government on how much it would cost to set up any newly independent Scottish state? First what was said in committee is absolutely correct. Our work was contained in Chapter 6 and Chapter 10 of the White Paper. Uh, that is the situation. And uh, I'll be happy if Ruth Davidson wants to pursue the point to look at some of the calculations that were made in Chapter 6 and Chapter 10 of the White Paper and explain the basis on which they were made. And perhaps the more elucidation of this point, the less... Uh, what was the Treasury Permanent Secretary called it? Less misbriefing. <laughs> the less misbriefing, that was his word in the Sunday Post. They had misbriefed a key statistic. So the more elucidation from the white paper, the better, because the white paper, once uh, Ruth Davidson gets around to reading it, provides the answers which she seeks. Ruth Davidson. Course, nobody in the First Minister's office would ever misbrief. Yeah, exactly. uh, but let's sum up where we are on this issue, because we know from the Finance Secretary in 2012 that he ordered work to, and I quote, build a comprehensive overview of the institution's costs and staff numbers required in the event of independence. Just last year, the Deputy First Minister actually confirmed that work was underway, telling a Commons committee, and I quote, we are doing a substantial piece of work on some of this just now. Suffice to say, it covers not just running costs, but it covers the issues around setup. But then last month, the First Minister's official spokesman said there was no overview, no documents, just, and I quote again, emails and jottings. Then this morning, a week after the Chief Economic Advisor said he'd done no work, we read report that reports that the government is now rushing out figures to paper over the cracks. So the people at the top of this government tell us that work has been commissioned, then they say it hasn't. They say the work is substantial, but then they say it isn't. They say it will be published before the referendum, but then they say it won't be. First Minister, the people of Scotland have to know, what is going on? Yeah. First Minister. <laughs> well, what's going on is uh, Ruth Davidson is waving the Daily Telegraph and pretending it's an independent publication. I, uh, I'm, I'm at the stage, I, I did describe the Daily Telegraph as the House Journal of the Labour Party, but of course, as we now know, it's a joint House Journal of the Comrades. <laughs> Uh, just to give an illustration of just how far-fetched that, that report was, the Daily Telegraph said on page four, interesting it was in page four, I think if they had a bit more confidence it may have been one of their big headlines, that they knew, they did have got information that Scottish Government officials had met Professor Patrick Dunlavy. I met Professor Patrick Dunlavy last week. Do you think if the Daily Telegraph had real information that they could display to the public, they would say that officials had met? I met Professor Patrick Dunlavy. And do you know why that's not a surprise? Because two weeks ago, at question time, in answer to Ruth Davidson, I said, that Professor Patrick Dunlavy is a man I want to meet. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and I now know exactly why the Treasury were engaged in misbriefing of Prof Professor Patrick Dunlavy's work. And the best way to describe it, as he described to me, it was the three problems, as he puts with the Treasury figures. Firstly, all 180 public bodies, they said, would be major departments, which they're not. Second, several of them already exist in Scotland and would simply need to be enlarged. Third, his estimate was applied to the chaotic way in which the last Labour government established new departments. And none of us would want to have the chaos of the Labour Party <laughs> visited on an independent Scotland. That is why Professor Dunlavy accused the Treasury of being bizarrely inaccurate and misplacing his work and overstating it by a factor of 12. Now, it may be that the Permanent uh, Secretary to the Treasurer describes bizarrely inaccurate and an exaggeration by a factor of 12 as a misbriefing of a key statistic. I think the people of Scotland will look at that and draw their conclusions that the unionist cabal, the comrades, are engaged in a campaign of trying to exaggerate the costs of an independent Scotland because they are aware that week by week the Yes campaign is gaining ground and will carry us to victory this coming September. Drew Smith. Hey.
Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. In the coming weeks, Glasgow stands ready to welcome the world. So I think we were all been concerned yesterday to see the BBC reports about so-called phantom uh, accommodation advertised on online booking sites. Uh, what assurances can the First Minister offer that public agencies will do everything possible to ensure that no games visitors are defrauded in this way and that those responsible will be subject to the full force of the law? First Minister. Well, these matters are already under investigation, as, as the member will appreciate. And more broadly, measures have been taken to ensure that the offering of uh, accommodation to the many visitors we are going to have received from around the world is as we would like it to be in terms of the charging system. That is a separate matter, as he will understand, from defrauding, but nonetheless an important matter in terms of Scotland's reputation. And he can be assured that ourselves, uh, our colleagues in Glasgow Council and the Games Organising Committee are fully aware of these dangers to reputation and are taking the appropriate action to make sure they do not come to pass. I would say that on the range of preparation for the Games, uh, these Games in Glasgow and Scotland are the best prepared, hopefully going to be the best run uh, Games, certainly in recent history, perhaps uh, in overall history of the Commonwealth Games. And we are working our hardest to make sure that these Games will be remembered and appreciated from people across the Commonwealth as an engagement in the greatest sporting and cultural festival that the Commonwealth has ever staged. Question three, Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues are of importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. This goes from uh, bad to worse, I have to say. The First Minister has been able to estimate the cost of his policies that he likes down to the last three decimal places. But on set-up costs, he can't even give us a quarter of a billion either way. Is he actually confirming today that there is nothing in the Telegraph report that is true about his decision to set up to set up a report to set up a report on the costs of setting up independence? Is that the case? Nothing in the Telegraph is true about that report being commissioned. First well, Willie Rennie, <laughs> my, my strong advice. <laughs> somebody says the weather forecast. I didn't read the weather forecast. <laughs> I'll have to go back and have a look at the horoscope as well. But Willie Rennie really shouldn't, shouldn't get to his feet. Uh, and his first words that come out are, this goes from bad to worse. That's no way to announce your question, uh, First Minister's <laughs> question. Can I say to the, the, the Daily Telegraph report has one snippet of truth in it. It says that officials met Professor Patrick Dunleavy. Yes, yeah, they did. They were with me. I met him and there were also uh, officials. And the reason I pointed this out to Ruth Davidson is Willie Rennie, who knows the Daily Telegraph, or at least is getting to know it as part of this unionist campaign, <laughs> uh, who knows the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. If the Daily Telegraph had an insight into the meeting with Professor Dunleavy and had actually known what had gone on, and they would know that I was there. Do you think the Daily Telegraph would have suppressed the information that I was at a meeting if they had the slightest idea what they're talking about? Now, the word nonsense, I think, was used by Wally Rennie. That's a very good, very good word to use as far as that report is concerned. And indeed, some would say more generally, excluding the weather forecast as far as the Daily Telegraph is concerned. Wally Rennie. This is, this is exactly why the people of Scotland are worried that this Scottish government, that this Scottish government is refusing to look at the downsides of independence. That's why they are concerned. They... Order! Order! The first... Order, let us hear Mr Rennie. Mr Rennie. The First Minister still doesn't have a clue about set-up costs. On the radio, John Swinney had 13 attempts and still couldn't answer the question. Just last week, two Cabinet Ministers said it was impossible. They've tried to tell us, on these benches, that never has a country been more prepared for the transition to statehood. <laughs> prepared, prepared on the costs of independence. He thought he could get away with it, but he's been caught red-handed. This is why this, the First Minister laughs, but the First Minister will not be laughing on the doorsteps when people ask him this question. They want to know the cost of setting up an independence. Is he going to give the answer? First Minister. Uh, well, I, I think a, a Liberal Democrat at the present moment 
should not talk to people about the reaction on the doorsteps. <laughs> Uh, and the, the fact that Willie Rennie's question received more resounding support from the Labour benches than they accorded to Joanne Lamont perhaps yeah. indicates a degree of desperation. So can I address the chapter six of the white paper and commend it to Willie Rennie because at some point he should go and read it which looks in very substantial detail uh, about the position of one of the four departments that Professor Dunleavy identified as actually having to be created in independent Scotland, and that is the Foreign Office and International Relations Department. And as you'll know, because I know he reads the white paper, it looks in great detail about the five thousand offices that the Foreign Office have internationally. We know from their recent statistics that they're worth £2.9 billion. That is in the Foreign Office recent uh, accounts. Scotland will be entitled to an asset share of that asset. We actually identify in the White Paper and look at international comparisons of similar countries and estimate 70, 90 to 90 embassies will be required for independent Scotland and point out that the cost of acquiring the overseas properties will be more than met by our share of the Foreign Office assets and also that the running costs on comparable examples will be less than our share that we contribute to the Foreign Office at the present moment. Presiding Officer, I'm sorry I've gone on to quote the detail, but it was the detail that Mr Rennie was asking for. And if he reads the white paper, he won't have to ask me for it. Question four, Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister how people in Scotland can benefit from a written constitution. First Minister. Well, I, I think uh, a written constitution provides uh, an underpinning and the basis for everyday life. I don't think it should be regarded uh, as something which is other than of fundamental importance. Every other country in the European Union, and indeed the Commonwealth, either has a written constitution or a constitution act. Scotland should be no different from that modern practice. Uh, a written constitution can benefit the people of Scotland by embodying our values as a nation, regardless of which political party is in power setting out and protecting the rights and the aspirations of our citizens and giving a firm underpinning to the fundamental principle that in Scotland the people are sovereign. Annabel Ewing. I thank the First Minister for his answer and can I ask him how he views the contrast between the Scottish Government proposals for a written constitution for Scotland 100% guaranteed by a yes vote with sovereignty lying with the people of Scotland with a pig in a poke offering from the anti-independence party. First Minister. Well, I, I think among the comrades we've got some secret yesers because Alistair Carmichael said last week when he was summing up why they can, when he admitted that any additional powers, and this is an exact quote from the 12th of June, are something that takes you into the realm of political debate as opposed to the guarantee which he said the Scotland Act powers offered. So the biggest problem I think for the anti-independence party is that in spite of all of that argument there is not a single power they can actually guarantee it will be devolved to the Scottish Parliament if there were to be a no vote. And given the track record, the track record of promises from the Conservative Party of vote no and get a better deal, do they really think that anyone in Scotland is going to argue and support and believe the joint position of the comrades when that Alistair Carmichael says it can't even be guaranteed. Little wonder the new comradely alliance is in such shaky foundations. Question five, Sarah Boyer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government would introduce a local income tax in the event of independence. First Minister. Well, they, as Sarah Boyd knows, that the Scottish Government has been consistent in opposition to the unfair council tax and working with local government, we brought an end to the era of 50% increases in council tax bills which occurred under previous administrations, both Tory and Labour. We are committed to consulting with others later in this Parliament uh, to develop a fairer and more progressive local tax based on the ability to pay. And as we set out in a manifesto in 2011, it's right that this consultation takes place following the referendum, once it is clear which taxpayers the Scottish Parliament has at our disposal following a yes vote, to ensure our tax system at all levels is fair to taxpayers, stimulates the economy and supports Scotland's public services. Sarah Boyer. 
It's an interesting answer because he didn't actually mention the local income tax, which he mentioned to newspapers in interviews and on radio. Does the First Minister still intend to set his local income tax rate at three pence? First Minister. Well, they, what we said in the manifesto is over the period of the next Parliament, we will consult with others to produce a fairer system based on the ability to pay to replace the council tax. We will put this to the people at the next election, by which time Scotland will have more powers over income tax. That is a perfect summary from the SNP manifesto. We tell what we are going to do. We explain the timescale for it. We intend to bring about a, a change to make sure that taxation in Scotland is based on the ability to pay. Uh, of course, I think I can count five positions from the Labour Party on whether they... Absolutely. Well, some people are saying six. I think it depends which sportsman is doing on whether or not they support a council tax freeze or not. But I am certain that when we come to this consultation, that the Labour Party will be first to bring forward their ideas and contribute positively to the debate, knowing that with independence we will have the full range of powers that allows us to choose the best tax system for the Scottish people. Gavin Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister promise to keep the local income tax rate a secret until after the referendum? <laughs> First Minister. I uh, promise that we will we'll implement the manifesto commitment that we made, which has served us pretty well with the Scottish people, rather better than the Conservative Party managed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Supporters Direct Scotland National Football Survey finding that 62% of respondents were in favour of lifting the ban on alcohol at football matches. First Minister. The 2014 National Football Survey, which was carried out by Supporters Direct Scotland on behalf of the SFA, covers several issues, including the ban of alcohol at football matches. Decisions on the matter are informed by Police Scotland who confirmed that they, at this stage, are not minded to seek a relaxation of the controls on alcohol at football matches, but are engaging with interested parties in reviewing this matter. Jimmy Day. Thank the First Minister for that answer. While everyone in Scotland would wish to ensure that football fans can continue to enjoy matches in a safe and pleasant atmosphere, is not it the case that Scotland has moved on significantly since the alcohol ban was imposed over 30 years ago with All Seater Stadium? Is not it time then that we reviewed the ban and would it not be possible to lift it on a trial basis and still maintain the good reputation of our national game? First Minister. Well, we are committed to working with all parties to help improve the overall match day experience and also ensure that football fans enjoy our national sport in a safe, enjoyable environment. Measures such as the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act 2012 are having a positive effect on offensive behaviour at football, which was reduced by nearly a quarter from last year. However, in both the 2012, 13 and 13, 14 reports on the Act, police reports describe 27 per cent of the accused as being under the influence of alcohol. As I said, I understand that Police Scotland are not at this stage minded to seek any relaxation of the controls of alcohol at football matches, but they are engaging with interested parties. Uh, but I know the member will bear in mind that figure of 27 per cent of the accused were under the influence of alcohol. Ms Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I have written directly to every senior football club in Scotland on this issue, and I have also met with the Chief Constable on this issue, also who I believe is an interested party in this. Um, given the stated open-mindedness that the, the First Minister has on this issue and the progression that we have seen in the many decades since this ban was first introduced, uh, could I ask him to consider a pilot project at one ground with some of the protections that are in place in other countries around the world where this has been uh, shown to work so we can see if this is one way in which we can bring in revenue to the, the uh, clubs that we have around the country of Scotland? First Minister. <coughs> I, can I say to Ruth Davison that uh, I will describe exactly what my response was, uh, which uh, I said that Police Scotland are not at this stage minded to seek a relaxation. Uh, they are engaging with interested parties in reviewing this, and we will take the direction of the police. But as I also pointed out to Jim Eady, who asked an identical question, that anyone arguing for this would have to take into account that although the number of offences is falling, and that is a welcome sign, and I think has been contributed to that success because of the legislation that has been passed. Nonetheless, it is the case 
that 27 per cent of the offences were committed by people who were under the influence of alcohol. Now, that figure should tell us that whatever these discussions and reviews come up with, that we have to have a approach which understands that alcohol is and a major contribution to disorder in society and to disorder and offensive behaviour at football matches. And I know, and that's why we take the police direction, that in their discussions with parties reviewing this matter, they have that in mind and will do nothing, absolutely nothing, uh, that would make the reputation of our game of uh, football any less uh, good than it is at the present moment, and they would do nothing uh, to render the experience of ordinary fans at football matches uh, and subject them to an increase in offensive behaviour. We are making significant improvements, and we have to bear these matters in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Um, before I end First Minister's questions, can I just point out to all members that the CPA Scotland branch annual general meeting will take place at 1pm today in committee room 2. You are all very welcome. Can I say that sandwiches will be available, um, but it's too soon to have the honey. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.